welcome. I'm Heather Hebert, uh, the new editor-at-large of Spaces Magazine, and this is uh, my first panel, Spaces Modern. Um, we um, are going to take a look at what modern design means to us today um, and how architects and designers and builders are creating spaces that reflect our needs uh, and desires and concerns um, and challenges right now. Um, we'll take a look at nature, uh, craft, uh, building, sustainability, stewardship, resiliency, uh, particularly important here in California. Um, and then our need for um, community, wellness, um, and a sense of joy in our spaces. Um, our panel, um, I'm super excited about our panel, um, it includes Joe Greet Chadha with Integrated Resources Group, Jonathan Feldman, the, uh, the founder of Feldman Architecture, Allison DeMonte, founder, uh, founder of Allison DeMonte Interior Design, and Dan Pelzinger, co-founder of uh, Matrosi Pelzinger Builders. Um, uh, each of these panels panelists is a leader in um, contemporary, the design and building of contemporary homes, and I could not be more excited about this group. Uh, my first one, so super excited. So here we go. Um, our first panelist is um, Joe Greet Chadha. And um, Joe Greet is the, there she is. Hello. She's the uh, director of sales and marketing for Integrated Resources Group, which is a family run business, uh, which I love, um, that has been providing stone and surfaces for architects, interior designers, builders, and their clients uh, for decades. Um, she started in this family business, uh, hanging out at the studio around the age of 12, and um, in 2019, joined as their director of marketing. Um, and Joe Greet uh, told us that, she's mentioned that she has noticed a shift um, in um, the way that people are using and interacting with their homes. Uh, that we've all noticed, of course, as we spend more time and different types of times in our homes. And it's particularly stands out to her as um, they work with the type, this, the um, materials that we touch and feel and interact with every single day, every minute of every day. So with that, without further ado, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Heather. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and as Heather mentioned, um, you know, I've really grown up around stone and helping homeowners and designers select stone for their projects. Um, really throughout the past decade, you know, the Bay Area and surrounding regions have grown tremendously. Um, but in particular, you know, the past couple of years, we've really seen a shift in clients' tastes, their desires, and, you know, the general trends um, for what clients want in their space. Um, and I think the last couple of years have really given us a new reference for modern design um, and how we approach modern design. Um, you know, homeowners have had a lot of time to consider and understand what their needs are, what their family's needs are, and what their true desires for their home space is. Um, so with that said, I, I think that's really the modern day client and modern family that designers, architects, and builders are all creating for. Um, I have a few um, specific projects that I want to highlight for their design approach and stone choices. So I'm going to go ahead and share that in just a moment. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see this. Um, in this recent project, this was actually created during the pandemic. Um, the designer created a his and her bathroom for a husband and wife that realized, you know, the value in personal space and wellness during the lockdowns. Um, the showers in both of these bathrooms showcase very exotic and unusual quartzites. And while this may not be considered, you know, a modern interior style in that it doesn't refer to the era of modernism. I feel like the way the designer approached this project with her client's needs at heart by creating a space that really prioritizes their wellness and their relaxation, as well as, you know, each individual's tastes. In that sense, you know, both of these spaces, both of the bathrooms really serve to or function to serve the couple's lifestyle needs. And I mean, I'm sure during the past couple of years, couples who live together, you and I, we all, re, you know, are kind of jealous of this project. I'm sure we all wish that we had our own bathrooms like this. 
in this next space um, that I'm highlighting here, um, our Calicutta marble was used to create this really beautiful wet bar and integrated sink. Um, what's really interesting here is that Calcutta marble is a material quarried in Italy that has been used throughout Europe for literally centuries. Um, what we've seen in the past couple of years with designers coming into our showroom is that you know, designers are starting to use this really traditional material in modern spaces and contemporary styles. Um, this particular space in being a wet bar, you know, it's clearly designed for the adults in the home. However, what I love about this space and what you may not be able to tell at first is that um, there are actually two large sliding white oak doors that fold into the cabinetry um, beside the wet bar. So the wet bar can actually be completely closed off and completely hidden. And this space is really multifunctional for a modern family because the room with the closed off bar is actually used by the homeowner's daughters for their ballet classes and ballet lessons. So this space easily goes from, you know, adult entertaining to wholesome dance practice with a breeze. And it seam seamlessly supports um, the lifestyle of really every member of the family. And I think it's a real, really beautiful representation of, you know, today's clients and the needs of today's family. In this next space, we see another very traditional marble choice being used. This one is called Paunazzo marble. Um, it has a really you know, beautiful, soft, honey-tinged hue that, in my opinion, almost gives off like a vintage or antique feel. Um, but in this space, it's used here in a very innovative and sophisticated manner. And the space is so artistically designed that you almost forget that it's a functioning kitchen and dining area. Um, it's becoming more common to see, you know, built-in cabinetry that hides the appliances. And um, the stone is on, you know, such a beautiful display here. Um, you really um, forget that the function, the features, the amenities that we all expect in a modern working kitchen, they're all there in this space, but it doesn't detract from the aesthetics in any way. And then in the last product that I want to highlight here, we see another example of where the refrigerator, you know, the wine cellar, the dishwasher, all these appliances are seamlessly built in with the neutral cabinetry to really achieve a space where the marble backsplash and marble countertop is, you know, fully displayed. Um, in this particular kitchen, the island is actually made of engineered quartz, a man-made material. So with marble being a stone surface that's a little bit more porous or softer than other stones, um, the island being made up of a man-made material gives um, the family um, a surface where they can be a little bit more, you know, relaxed or careless, if you will, um, you know, with wine or um, with using acids like lemons, things like that. It gives them a working station in the kitchen. However, the material is still very light and neutral. And you, again, almost don't notice or you forget that it's not also made up of marble because the marble backsplash is just, you know, beautifully shown in the space. So I think that small added, you know, element of added functionality, it doesn't take away um, from the breathtaking design or the stone at all. Um, before I, I give it back to Heather, I'm just going to wrap up my thoughts really quick by, you know, again, emphasizing how today's designs are just highly attuned to clients' lifestyle and their day-to-day -day needs and really what clients want um, from, from their space. Um, in all of these really bespoke designs, you know, there's no compromising of functionality for aesthetics. Um, I really have to give it to, you know, the designers, the architects, and the builders on all of these projects who are giving it all to their client. You know, they're creating these amazing, stunning projects where that showcase the stone um, in such a beautiful manner. Um, and they're pushing the envelope, creating these out of the box designs. But, you know, the key thing is that the functionality um, is there. The amenities that, you know, today's client and family wants to live a very convenient and efficient lifestyle all of that is there. So I think that's something that, you know, I've seen really grow um, in design in the past couple of years. 
So I'll go ahead and, and hand it back to Heather because I'm excited to hear, um, you know, the builder, architect, and design perspective on, on modern design. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Jonathan Feldman. Um, Jonathan founded his award-winning um, architecture firm in 2003 and is known throughout the region, throughout California, for um, truly impressive, iconic, uh, contemporary homes. And I hope he's not embarrassed by my saying that. I am a huge fan. Um, I first met Jonathan interviewing him for my uh, latest book, At Home in the Wine Country, uh, where we featured two of his projects. Uh, could have featured more, but that was our limit by anyone, architect. Um, and what struck me was his commitment to creating spaces that really improve the way his clients live and improve the way that they interact with the land around them with the planet. Um, he's truly committed to that. And um, um, and then since getting to know him more, I'm equally impressed at the way that he is pushing the envelope of the way a practice is built and the way the architectural process for a residential project takes place and that shared vision that's created. And I think that is equally important. Um, his book, first book, Immersed, was published by Oro Editions this spring. Super excited. I've looked at it cover to cover. And um, welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, high praises mean a lot coming from you. I'm a big fan of uh, your publications, um, and we're super happy to be included in your most recent book, which is amazing. Um, let me bring up my presentation here. Uh, we got it. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm excited to participate in this conversation about what modernism means today. I've always thought of myself as a modernist, um, which to me is really comes down to a mindset about looking forward and thinking about tomorrow and how our designs today might anticipate uh, the future needs of the world, of the people in the buildings, of our communities. Uh, I think we'll all probably agree that the world has radically changed in the last few years, and so has our perspective on many things. This change uh, is shapes how we think about the future and including how we want to live, where we want to live, and what we think is important. So it's an interesting conversation to be having at this point in time. Um, our studio was founded about 20 years ago. Uh, we have always been in San Francisco. Uh, we do residential, commercial, hospitality, and interior design work, although the, still the large majority of what we do is single-family homes. Um, so we will be focusing my thoughts today uh, on the residential projects. Um, we are... Uh, our, our team has grown in the last couple of years. Um, oh, I'm excited. Uh, about the uh, team that we've been able to assemble, led by my three amazing partners. Um, we've, uh, we've accumulated a, a great uh, practitioners who have vast variety of skills um, that they bring to our highly collaborative process. Um, and they all share this culture of professionalism, teamwork, and passion and commitment, which uh, kind of is the anchor of our design. I want to take just a few minutes to talk about uh, some of the themes that run through our residential work. Um, and uh, this is the first house that I designed, and I think it was pretty formative in kind of setting the trajectory of the work that followed. Um, this is a house on a very challenging site. Um, in retrospect, probably more challenging than an architect should try to design on for their first project. A uh, very steep grade and a thick wooded site, really challenging to imagine uh, where to even place a house and then technically how to pull it off to ensure the health of the trees and preserve the habitat. Um, but it led to some of the themes about highly site sensitive design and also about sustainability. This house was designed and uh, it was oriented uh, as a, in a southeasterly orientation with a lot of thermal mass and glazing and roof oak overhangs. Um, designed to passively heat and cool uh, with minimal uh, uh, active heating and cooling systems needed throughout the winter or summer months. Um, uh, and, and it taught us a lot. Um, it also uh, was published and won a few design awards, both for design and for sustainability. 
Um, and that was wonderful in that uh, after this, it led to a number of clients kind of seeking us out who had similar aligned goals of trying to find um, site sensitive solutions and also with an eye towards uh, stewardship of the land and ecologically sound design. Um, so this is uh, one of the projects that shortly followed that. Um, you know, we were very excited to start to think about kind of how these very different sites might shape the architecture um, and how each building would be a unique response to these um, early on, they were these beautiful rural uh, majestic sites. Um, but then we started thinking about uh, this is a suburban site and how, you know, where you don't have uh, full immersion in nature, how you might still be able to create some of the ethos of that, some of this connection to the outdoors. Um, and so this is uh, a, a couple of backyard pavilions that we put in a house uh, in Atherton. Um, interestingly, this was finished just before the pandemic, um, but these type of structures, uh, we are now seeing, uh, and these were published, and then um, during the pandemic, they got a lot of attention because these type of structures really served uh, this family well. But a lot of people are, are looking for the type of spaces where they can create their own sanctuaries. This is an outdoor kitchen for entertaining, and it's a yoga studio, um, two activities that I think people now value much higher than maybe they would have before, um, just sort of knowing what the world has thrown at us recently. Um, there's also a, a high focus in our projects uh, on taking advantage of our wonderful climate um, and creating these indoor outdoor living spaces. Um, it has uh, it's obviously uh, something that people really love, but it also allows us to think about how we can make maybe smaller spaces feel bigger. So we have less uh, less impact on the land, um, because when you start taking away walls and letting spaces flow outside, suddenly maybe you don't need as much conditioned space. Um, which is uh, an exciting opportunity to kind of reduce our footprint. Uh, there's another building where the walls just completely open up. This is just a 2,000 square foot, two bedroom, two and a half bath home um, that just becomes basically an outdoor pavilion. Um, this is a tight urban site where we create a, a, a series of these little pocket gardens. Um, I'll say this is right next to a multi-story uh, multifamily building, apartment building. Um, so not a beautiful, pristine greenfield site. Um, but yet we were able to make these little sanctuaries and blur the lines between indoor, outdoor in a way that kind of rethought what a traditional suburban front yard, backyard approach to design is. These are all um, very much not that in terms of how we place the buildings to create outdoor spaces. Um, and the, even in our tight urban spots, urban sites, kind of this indoor outdoor living and how um, just even a little bit of space might be enough to really make walls open up and spaces flow outside. So that's in San Francisco. Um, I think it's also worth talking about just sustainability and climate issues that are now so acute. This is something I touched upon in the first house that we designed and something that we were fortunate enough to attract like minded clients early on when most clients may be weren't willing to pay for uh, thinking about uh, their responsibility. But um, I think it's now we're all much more aware of sort of the dire situation we're in with the climate and also about uh, how much our homes and our buildings contribute to the problem. The creation and operation of buildings is such a significant portion of uh, in, causing and producing these greenhouse gases. And um, and our perspectives on sustainability has changed a lot over the years. Um, we right now have the ability to really think about some very focused ideas about what is our carbon footprint. Um, this is something that is relatively new to the conversation and really allows us to um, measure uh, how much carbon goes into creating our buildings and into operating our buildings. And what can we do to minimize that by choosing different materials, um, reducing the size of our buildings, but then also how we can offset that with sequestering materials and uh, energy harvesting and planting of trees. So it's a super exciting time. Um, but I'm even more excited about how maybe the thought of sustainability might 
shape the actual form making and select the materials and lead us to a different architecture. So on the left is a diagram about how a build this building, um, it's the same building on the right or the left, how it was, the roofs were shaped to bring in the solar winter low sun angles and warm up these uh, earthen and concrete walls um, to create a passive heating, but then keep the sun out. And then those same mass walls would keep the building cool in the hot summertime. And how the storage of water, um, which allows us to uh, hydrate our gardens and we can even use it inside the buildings um, now to reduce our water consumption. Um, how the water tanks themselves can start to become these sculptural elements. Um, and not to mention uh, provide this fire resiliency, which is very much on our mind in California these days um, by hydrating the land and keeping it uh, a resilient landscape around it with green greenery, but also having big tanks of water should you need them for actually a fire event. Um, here's a diagram of how in an urban house, we had some pretty uh, forward thinking consultants help us with this blue and green roof system that would gather rainwater, collect reused uh, bath, shower, and sink water, pump them through the land to hydrate, which would also act to filter the water. And then we put it back up on the blue roofs to store them and further filter them. And so water gets used multiple cycles, the same water through this house multiple times gets used over and over again. Uh, to really reduce our footprint. Um, this is uh, rammed earth is a material that we've used a few times that is so beautiful and prevents the soil that normally gets excavated and off hauled off site to actually use that uh, locally to create these beautiful art walls that also have the thermal mass um, that helps moderate the temperatures of the building. Um, and I'm super excited about how kind of as modernists we can think about this is a very old technique, um, but how we can start to think about the detailing of it and the engineering of it um, in new ways to create a very fresh architecture. Uh, we're also very focused on wood these days. Um, and although there are a lot of challenges with fire, for sure, with wood buildings, um, wood has this amazing ability when you uh, spec it and, 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 and source it from a sustainably harvest forests um, to sequester carbon and offset the intense concrete that is often, uh, sorry, the intense carbon that is often in the concrete and steel that we are putting in our houses, although we're trying to reduce the concrete and steel for sure. Um, but trying to think about wood uh, and using it more and more in a way that really kind of helps our entire uh, carbon footprint. So those were just some initial thoughts and Heather was kind enough to mention our book, but I just wanted to point out um, We've never published a book before and we're super excited. This just came out a few months ago and there's a lot more information on our studio and uh, these projects that I've pointed out and others uh, in our book, which is uh, available widely. Um, thank you, I'm excited to be on this panel and I look forward to hearing from the other speakers and to the conversation that we will have with Heather. Thank you so much. Um, quick note, uh, the, the project that Jonathan shows on the cover of his book was one of the projects we covered in, in ours. So I was pretty thrilled to see that. Um, our next panelist is Alison DeMonte. And um, Alison describes herself, I love this, as fearless, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, she is I, a, a wonderful interior designer that um, is influenced by a broad range of design movements from Bauhaus to space exploration, right? Um, what I particularly love about Allison, why I'm so excited to have her here today is um, her eclectic approach to what it means to be contemporary, integrating um, not only super contemporary um, furnishings and finishes into her interiors, but vintage, local craft, which is also something that's important, I think, in our contemporary world. Um, and um, she she just brings this super fresh, super interesting approach um, to the modern design conversation. So welcome. Thank you, Heather. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. And uh, I'm really excited to be here talking a little bit about uh, the work that I do. I am a I run a small interior design firm in the city uh, and we focus primarily on residential work, but I am not opposed to doing other work. Uh, but what I thought would be interesting today 
as sort of an introduction to what I do is to show three projects that I've done over the past 10 years for a single client and how working with a client over time, of course, you know, your relationship with them evolves and, and is becomes much stronger, but also the context um, and the personality of the client and how that is interpreted through different types of homes and homes from different eras in, in design. So without further ado, um, the first house is up in the Berkeley Hills. It's a pretty traditional, typical, I would say, mid-century modern house designed by UC Berkeley architect. We started work on this in 2013. And this was one of the first projects that I did um, as a designer, and it followed another mid-century project that I'd worked on. So I think that I was still exploring my own style in terms of the context of a home and how that relates to the objects that we put in it and the style that, you know, what influences sort of the design of, of that house. And so this was a very typical mid-century house, like I said, you know, big open windows, lots of access to indoor, outdoor. Um, and we brought in some uh, just dots of color, signature mid-century moves. Um, so going through, you can see um, one of the things that's really important to me and that I actually think is a very contemporary idea in design is the inclusion of vintage furniture. Um, I think that vintage really gives a home soul and it also uh, is a way that we can mitigate our footprint on the planet um, by reusing these objects that have been made and, and probably made more sustainably really than uh, most of the things that are made today that, that are available to purchase. So a couple design classics in this shot, um, Eames chair and Saren and table, we all know and love them. Uh, the, so this client in this first iteration of the house had come to me with some furniture that they owned, but they also had and were creating a, a great art collection. So, you know, they wanted big white walls. Um, and that worked well with the mid-century flow of this project. Um, you know, it, it lent itself well to sort of a, you know, I would say like a pretty standard design in terms of mid-century. Um, and we really, like I said, this was one of my first projects. So trying to just sort of find my feet as a designer and figure out what it meant to design for the context of a mid-century house. And one thing I wanna point out in this last photo of this project is that the house was designed in 1964 and the two pieces of furniture that are um, prominent here are the Warren Platner easy chair on the left, which was designed in 1966, and the Raymond Lowy dresser, which was designed in 1965. So these pieces were both designed at the same time that the house was built. They could have been in the house, although the internet has made it much more possible for us to start to blend these ideas from different places on the planet. Um, that, you know, this dresser was designed by a French designer, so probably wasn't really in the Bay Area. Um, Warren Platner was in the US. So, um, but blending these styles, kind of bringing this eclectic idea together, even if it is very cohesive with the time period of the house is an important part of my process. Um, so the next house was built uh, as a vacation weekend home up in Sonoma. It was constructed with the idea that, you know, the fear of fire was definitely a real, a real thing. Um, and it was also built modularly. So in some senses, the style of this house is still modern, but it is designed for the way we live now and not the way that we lived in 1960, 1960s. So um, again, you know, like big indoor, outdoor, um, indoor, outdoor feel, some of the same principles that were in that mid-century house apply in this house as well. Um, and one of the things that I really want to emphasize is my love of vintage furniture again, um, is the idea that when a house is brand new, what you put in it to make it feel like it's inhabited and that it's, um, has a soul is really important. So again, we leaned even further with this house on both my love and the client's love of vintage furniture, um, blending you know, different styles from different, um, different periods of time, but pretty strictly still sort of in the mid-century, 1960s, 1970s um, world. And yeah, these rosewood chairs, we don't know who designed them, but they're so fabulous, <laughs> love them. Um, and 
Let's see what's next. So in this image, um, again, blending in some vintage, the light fixtures are from the 70s. We purchased them from an Italian dealer. Um, I actually saw these fixtures in Italy, but then I came back and kept thinking about them. And then I emailed the vendor. So, you know, the internet's an amazing, amazing resource um, and Instagram and all of those social media uh, channels that allow us to sort of see things from around the world and, and bring all of those influences into our own work. And so those, like I said, were vintage. We worked with Fireclay Tile to develop a custom version of a tile they had created for the backsplash uh, that was supposedly, um, well, it is based on crop circles, but I really saw vinyl records and music is a big part of the client's life. So we thought that that was a great way of bringing in some personal feel into the house. And then we custom designed this uh, kitchen island for the client um, as well. And so this is a good example here of like that blending of styles. These chairs were designed in 1926, so Bauhaus. Um, and they work really well with a contemporary table that is designed by a New York uh, designer group called Egg Collective. So I think that that tension that's created between new and old can really um, enliven a space, make it more special, make it feel more personal and more unique. And it's something that I always strive for in my own work. These are just some other photos of the projects. I love color, I love pattern. So trying to bring those in in, in contemporary ways. Um, and actually, I'm going to go back to this photo because I kind of skipped over it. But uh, the wallpaper on the left is hand painted by a team of people in Kansas City, which is amazing to think that there is a company that's hand painting wallpaper in Kansas City. I love this. Um, and so they custom uh, painted this, colored this for this space. And I think it's just such a special element to include in projects whenever possible. You know, things that are made by hand still is just a wonderful, wonderful element to bring into any project. On the right, the headboard is custom designed by our office. Um, when we can, we like to um, design things that fit the spaces exactly perfectly as we wanted them to um, and was fabricated on site by a woman um, actually from Sacramento who did the work on site, which is amazing to have um, as a resource in the Bay Area. And it's really important for me also to seek those people out in my work who can fabricate things and who are still doing craft work and um, make sure that they're employed and that those crafts get to continue on because um, handmade things are becoming less and less common in our world. So the final project um, is a bit of a surprise probably. Um, the client in March, 2020 called me up and said, we're buying a new house and I'm tired of living with white walls. So they sort of, in some ways, turned their back on the idea of what modern design is. They said, I'm tired of this um, and I just want something new. I wanna try something new. And that was an incredibly exciting experience for me because what it allowed for was this sort of freeing idea, like a license to move away from like the strict ideas of what does it mean to design modern work or modern interiors because we had this incredibly old shell. I'd never worked in a project that was this old. So it was really like sort of an evolution of my work with the client, my work as a designer, and like, how do I interpret modern design in different types of projects? And so here again, blending different styles, different pieces of furniture, um, the it sort of creates an eclectic uh, mix that I think is very contemporary right now. Um, and, and again, very personal. So here there's, for example, a 60s French brutalist table that we sourced from Belgium. Uh, and we've got also contemporary chairs that were in the style of Gio Ponti. So really um, just trying to bring in different styles from different time periods. And I'm gonna go quickly through these. Uh, wallpaper that has a very heavy deco influence, but felt, feels like more contemporary in the house, blended again with the clients, very, very modern art collection, Marilyn Minter on the left. And yeah, I think that, um, you know, these are just some more examples of how modern can be, uh, you know, interpreted in different types of, of projects. 
So um, right here on the right, I'm just gonna make one quick comment here. This tile was a source from Heritage Tile in Chicago, and it's something that we felt like could have been in the house. Heritage Tile did the original tile design for the New York City subway mosaics. And so we felt like that was an interesting material to bring in that felt like it could have existed in the house when it was built in uh, 1915. And with that, I just wanna, um, close and say thank you. Um, and thank you for letting me share this work and show how the evolution of working with a client over time can really um, create something very modern in, in a way um, and progress as a, like progress as a designer um, is such an important part of my practice. So thank you so much, Heather, back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Um, our next speaker, our final uh, panelist is um, Dan Pelsinger. Um, Dan co-founded Matrosi and Pelsinger Builders in 1985. Yeah, spent the first five years um, working on Victorian and Edwardian homes in San Francisco and then made and a very intentional shift to focus on contemporary structures. And he has done so ever since. Um, he's worked with many of the region's leading contemporary architects, um, Adeline Darling, EYRC, CLB um, in, um, in the Rockies, Walker Warner, and of course, Feldman Architecture. So without further ado, Dan, welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. I'm excited to be on with everyone else here. I'm going to open up some uh, slides and get through those. I know that we're, we want to save some time to, uh, um, for, for questions and to see how it goes. Uh, exciting to see all the work that we've seen already. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. Um, we've been, um, as Heather was saying, we've been blessed to work with some of the top architects and designers in the Bay Area and uh, in Wyoming. We've, we, we've opened in the last uh, seven years an office in Jackson Hole. And so we've been working there as well here as uh, here in uh, California. I got a ton of photos. I'll go through them. This is a project with Aitlin Darling. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Josh and David. They're great to work with. We've had some wonderful successes with them. Uh, we've had some wonderful successes with their clients and with all the clients that we've I'm showing these projects. Uh, this is a project in San Francisco. Uh, this is one in Jackson, Wyoming. This was done with uh, uh, Carney Logan Burke, CLB Architects. Uh, different uh, in when we started in Jackson about ten years ago, there was not a lot of modern work being done. That's why it was starting off there, and we were really excited to be part of the first real modern projects that were coming along. They're a great firm, uh, great to collaborate with. Um, the um, different challenges of working in, Mon in uh, Wyoming and Montana, the work there. This is a project that we did with EYRC in Palo Alto. G fantastic architects, fantastic clients, really a challenging, um, uh, interesting project for us. Lots of, lots of glass, lots of very modern project. Uh, definitely pushing the limits of, of uh, what was being built in Palo Alto at that time and it was being done now. Uh, really excited about working with uh, Stephen Ehrlich and uh, Takashi and I um, and uh, fantastic clients. Uh, again, uh, Christy Will was the um, uh, designer on this project, really a, a great team to work with. Here is a, a project that we did with Jonathan in San Francisco, working on a very tiny street up in Telegraph Hill, uh, very modern project, very um, hard to get access to, uh, but great project and um, have as with all our projects, we've uh, kept a long-term relationship with and uh, make a make a habit of maintaining these projects. We've been we've converted. Here's a project in Half Moon Bay. Wonderful clients again. This is with Brooks Walker of Walker Warner Architecture. Uh, the challenge here was 
the uh, client, the, the, the husband really wanted an, uh, an, an Apple store and the, uh, the wife really wanted something, a Cape Cod type architecture. And they worked really well together with Brooks and his team to, uh, to come up with a, a hybrid and uh, something that um, they're very, very happy with. All these projects, uh, this project became a real haven during the pandemic and uh, gl really glad to get this done before the pandemic and uh, a place for them to both work from. Uh, uh, this is another Walker Warner project also work with Brooks. These are some, uh, this is on in Pacific Heights in San Francisco. Um, different, uh, more contemporary than modern, but a nice mix. Um, uh, Rad Design out of Berkeley was a great team to work with, as well as the Walker Warner team. Um, uh, enjoyed it a lot. This uh, these project, this is a project uh, on Webster Street in San Francisco. Um, Allison was talking about a brutalist architecture, which is what this was. It was an old institutional building that was changed into a residential project. Uh, very, some different challenges with this one, with the concrete core uh, of a building and a very um, great art collector's um, a real, a real fantastic project to work with. This one is uh, an Aidlin Darling project that we work with uh, on um, Russian Hill. Lots of fun to work on this project. This, there was no access whatsoever to this project. So all the materials had to bring, it was off of uh, McCondry Lane. The project had to be brought in. Everything, all the materials had to be brought in through an alley. You could not drive up to the project. Um, really happy with this project. Matt Dimitrov, who's working with us in Jackson Hole now, was the superintendent for this project. Um, just a just a, a real challenge. Great working with Joshua and David and their teams. Uh, as you can see, we've been absolutely blessed to work with some fantastic architects and designers. This is a project we also did with Aidlin Darling on the Great Highway. Um, so you got to admire them from that. Uh, good surf storage. Here's our office. We've built, uh, we've been involved with green and sustainable architecture. And Aidlin Darling helped work with us to combine an old warehouse that was built in 1912 um, and give it a new face. And it housed Bar Agricole and now... Um, Californios restaurants. Our offices are here. It's, it was the first green, uh, first gold plat slash platinum commercial building through uh, Mayor Newsom's uh, accelerated project for green projects, accelerated uh, permitting for green projects. And this is where we work to this day. Um, and this is who we are. We've converted to uh, an ESOP, so we're an employee-owned construction company, and um, we're really grateful to be on this panel with these very talented people. Take it away, Heather. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, wow, those were some pretty amazing images. Um, so now uh, we've, we're going to pull up everybody on on, on so to speak, whatever you call it, on screen. And um, we get a chance to, um, I'm gonna ask some questions, talk amongst ourselves, take questions from anybody who's watching who might have a question. I've got plenty. So if you don't have one, it's fine. Um, um, and kind of kind of have that, you know, interaction between ourselves that I always find the most interesting um, when I'm, when I'm uh, watching panels with experts. Um, the first thing that jumps out at me is, um, well, beyond the astounding visual quality of all the work is um, the the difference between modern and contemporary. We've talked about modern and con contemporary, right? Mid-century, most 
prominently jumps out as a, as a period, right? And a period where um, industrial processes in producing architecture and uh, furnishings allowed good design to be available to a broader audience, which was great and very of the time. And that's kind of what resonates with us now, because that was design that was of the time, but also very future look oriented um, with um, some some sort of mission under underlying it. Um, but it's different than contemporary. We're talking about contemporary design as well as modern design. So I, I guess my thought here is what what do we see, you know, anybody jump in here, what do we see as some of the through lines between what we're talking about in modern design? Because a lot, Allison, you're pulling in modern, you know, you're putting in, you're pulling in, um, Vintage furnace, furnishings, many from mid-century. Even when you're not working, you did that on a mid-century, but you also did that at Down Tempo, which was the uber contemporary uh, project that she showed, which was constructed largely of prefabricated um, um, modular units. So, what do we see as the as as the through lines, um, Allison? Sorry, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but yeah, I mean, I think. I think just really quickly, I think one thing that I was trying to highlight is that like the idea of sort of, um, you know, these, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but these objects, you know, that you, that you put in your house and like how they're applied to the house and how, you know, I don't know. Someone said something about like modernism is forward looking. And I think a lot of these objects were forward looking in, in some at some point in time, but just because they might not be forward looking any longer, they still have a use and they still have a purpose and they still tell us about like design history um, in a way that I think is really important. And I think that they, you know, they were crafted in different ways and they were made out of maybe more sustainable materials, sometimes less sustainable. Um, but you know, it, it's just really, really important what goes into these projects um, in terms of like, it's not just how they're built, it's, it's also like how they're lived in, how they're furnished. Okay. And another, Joe Greet, you brought it up too. The, um, in particular, the kitchens where you've got very contemporary cabinetry, right? Everything's hidden away, which makes absolute sense, right? Because we're using, say, the dining room becomes an office, yeah. right? So you don't have to look at your blender while you're having a Zoom call meeting, right? Um, but then there's these very traditional pops of finishes. Do, do you... Have yeah, you. I mean, we like I said, you know, we're seeing designers really use these materials that, you know, used to be used in very traditional spaces, traditional kitchens in very innovative and contemporary ways. And they're being used in spaces that are, you know, like I highlighted, multifunctional. And that's something that really stemmed, I think, from, you know, the pandemic and the early lockdowns um, when clients realized, you know, they needed spaces for, you know, to support, you know, all the different family members, um, different kinds of lifestyles. Um, and that still, you know, people are still using these really amazing materials um, in functional spaces. Um, so I think, you know, similar to using kind of vintage furniture, these timeless, you know, these marbles are, you know, maybe it's overused, but they're truly timeless. Um, and designers are using them in very new ways. Um, and we're talking about cross-functional spaces, right? Um, and, um, you know, and the things that, that are prevalent today, you know, cross-functional spaces, the combination of periods that make up contemporary design. I mean, we're talking about contemporary as a, a here and now. What are our, what's our mission here and now? I mean, I know it's too big a term perhaps, but you know, what are we looking for? And Jonathan, you and I were talking yesterday and Dan too about, um, you know, we're creating, we're create, enabling a life in these spaces. You know, it's not just that we're we're pushing the envelope. You particularly are pushing the envelope in terms of contemporary design, but you're enabling people to live their values. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I know I'm totally putting you on the spot. I'm sorry, <laughs> but we talked about it yesterday. Um, you know what what you know uh, ways in which you are allowing people to sort of other ways besides, you know, the indoor outdoor, but other ways you're enabling people to sort of live out those values around sustainability, 
um, and, you know, kind of care for the planet and concern for the planet. Sure. Um, I don't know if Dan, you have any thoughts to, to get us started. I'm not, not quite sure exactly where to start on that. Um, I, I guess to talk about this is, I think to talk about the sustainability of our work and, and the collaboration, I think that's really important between builder designer uh, client and, and uh, architect yeah. to make sure that we're all kind of rowing the boat in the same way and, and trying to make our work as, as fresh and also as, uh, as sustainable as possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that conversation that I think you're referring to yesterday, which was really interesting to me as well, um, really focuses on the fact that often, and this isn't always the case, and in some ways this is maybe a difference in my mind between contemporary and modern, but for these clients who really want to push to something that nobody's seen before. Um, they want, we sit around and we ask ourselves, like, how could we potentially live and not just, you know, that, and I think you were saying that the house that Pinterest built, like we, so many people have so many images in mind and they're like, I like this, I like this. And we're not just putting them together like a patchwork quilt, um, but really doing some soul searching of like, we have this opportunity to design a space that will shape the way our families live uh, into the future. And that's such a great opportunity. And let's be open to what that could be. And that leads us to um, just some challenges of like, well, what about using this new material or this new system in a different way? Like early on, people were like, what if you put a garage door in a living room? Like that was a radical idea. But there are newer versions of that um, that are really challenging. And I think uh, it's a tougher uh, ask of the design team. It's certainly a tougher ask of the builder. Um, and so um, you need the right type of clients who are open to this exploration and honestly open to risk, right? Like risk in both in terms of putting things together that have never been put together, like physical mm -hmm. risk, uh, but then also risk of like, we don't know exactly what it will be like to live in that space, but let's speculate and let's propose something that's a little bit radical. Um, and that might lead us to something that's better than what we have seen in the past. And to me, that is kind of the heart of modernism is kind of that optimism of like, hey, we can do better than what we've seen before. Um, you know, and that is exciting. And to the point of our earlier conversation, like the architect can't do that alone, right? Like that's something that takes all hands on. And we need people like Dan in the room to come in and say, all right, now that's a really cool idea, but let me tell you a hundred ways that goes wrong or challenges that I have in putting this together and sequencing it and all of that stuff. So it really is super collaborative. Like we're all just dreamers here and then we need um, real practitioners and craftspeople and engineers and everybody else to kind of help us vet it and turn it into something that's functional and you know dependable, right? Uh, gives us a high chance of success. Well, we also talked yesterday about the, um, you know, how that's impacting the process with your clients and how important it is to get as many people like everybody here on the panel on board early um, so that it's a shared process and creating a shared vision because you've got a sense of um, community built around that shared vision where you're, do you find that that enables clients to take a little more of a risk or I, how, how do you approach that early shared vision sort of piece? Of yeah. It? We talked about this too, cause you come yeah. in. Yeah, no, we do. And I think the old way would be, you know, the architect designed the house and then the interior designer would finish it out inside. And then the landscape architecture would, landscape architect would design around it. And then the builder would figure out how to build it. Right. But that's so piecemeal and each piece is not informed by the knowledge of the other people. Right. And so the idea of getting everybody in the room at day one with a blank piece of paper and start to dream together, because if we put the house here, it changes what the landscape could be. You know, we work with landscape architects who are always empowered to move our buildings around to create better rooms and connections and interior That's a lot of designers. <laughs> yeah. No, and we care a lot about materials, but we don't want our materials to be baked before an interior designer is coming in there and making the whole thing super cohesive, right? Yeah. Like our concrete walls or a lot of our interior materials move outside. And so the landscape architect has to weigh in on those. Um, but even more importantly, like having a full set of dock and then sh docks and then shopping it around to multiple builders for bids 
in no way informs how we've drawn, right? Like we right. need- And you said you know, you're drawing. not looking that way very much anymore, right? No, that so is, it used to be all our clients way. wanted that and we'd have to beg them not to. And now I don't know anybody really who is working in that way, except, you know, in a really unusual and unfavorable conditions, right? Like I just think the enlightened project flow is get that builder on early, certainly already have the interior designers and the landscape architects and honestly even have the suppliers and the fabricators and the craftspeople weighing in early on right like we are pulling materials and conceptual design like we're going to to jagreed and saying like this is kind of a palette i have in mind what do you have that i can source and then we'll pull those in and we'll build around that right early on not just painting materials at the end of a baked design process Great. Well, we have reached our time um, as fast as that. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. And I want to thank the four of you so much uh, for making this first panel for me so enjoyable and so informative. And um, thank you to anybody who's watching uh, for joining us. And um, we hope you have a wonderful day. Honored. Thank you thank very you much. So much. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>